Hi, this is Eric, and you are listening to the Long Box Review Comic Book Podcast. Welcome to the show. Uh, Today's episode is going to be a return of something that I did last year that um, decided I wasn't going to do anymore, but I really kept thinking about it and wanted to bring it back because it gets me to talk about, it allows me to talk about uh, a bunch of different comic books that I've been reading. Um, And that is the pull list review episodes. And so um, even though this is, as I record this, it's March, who knows when this will come out. (laughs) So I'm already behind, way behind, but that's okay. Uh, I still want to talk about these comics. Uh, And so I'm going to be talking about the comics that I read in January, 2024, uh, of which there were 55. I'm not going to be talking about each and every one of these. And uh, my intent was only to talk about the ones that I really wanted to talk about. But as I started taking notes on these various comic books, um, it turns out I had things to say about most of them. (laughs) So I don't know. Buckle up, maybe. Uh, This might be a long one. Who knows? And so this is not going to be like in-depth reviews of these comic books. These are just... Some real quick thoughts, because there's so many, um, and uh, we'll just get into it. But to start off with, uh, just to mention, I read Amazing Spider-Man number 248, uh, but I've already talked about this on the uh, Kid Who Collects Spider-Man episode with Troy Wilson. That was episode 240, released on January 17th of 2024. And then the next one, uh, Marvel Super Special Battlestar Galactica which I've already talked about on uh, episode 241, which is my Comics History November-December 1978 episode that I released in February, uh, on February 7th. So go listen to those episodes. And I think there's maybe one or two more of those on the list. No, these are all the rest of these. Nope, one more. One more when we get to it. Uh, The rest of these are things that I have not talked about before. And the first of which is Parker Girls, Volume 2, which are uh, which contains issues 6 through 10, uh, the second half of the series by Terry Moore, uh, and uh, Brian Miller and Steve uh, Hamaker, Ham- Hay- Haymaker? I don't know, <laughs> on the cover color, uh, colors. I was on uh, Pins and Needles uh, because of the ending to Volume 1, with Kachu getting drugged and captured, while the villain in... The second half, uh, this volume two, gets his comeuppance in the end. Uh, I was let down by how that happened at first. When I was rereading this uh, to take notes, I realized I wanted Kachu to rain down vengeance on that son of a bitch with a righteous anger. But that would have been the, you know, the trite, stereotypical, easy fashion to depict that. Uh, Instead, Terry Moore ups the stakes with the villain by having some business partners deal with his theft and betrayal that's described in the story. Um, Unsurprisingly and satisfactorily, the book ends with how it should always end when it comes to Kachu, her reuniting with Francine, and all is right in the world. I I have also noticed that more and more villains in comic books uh, are of the very rich and male variety. (laughs) I know, you know, uh, I see that as a thinly veiled Trump stand in or stands in, uh, which amuses me to no end down, down with the oligarchs. All right. (laughs) Next up is new X-Men volume one. This contains issues 114 through 116 annual 2001 and issues 117 through 126 by quietly Cordy Van Skyver, you Derenick. Morrison, Grant Morrison, Townsend, Morales, Rollins, Green, Alangalan, uh, Mickey, Perota, Hannah, Floria, Haberlin, Hi-Fi Design, RS, and Seda T. Wow, that's a lot. That's, this, this is one of the epic collections. This is the first volume of the, as they put on the cover, the Grant Morrison collection. So um, I'm continually continuing slowly my Grant Morrison read. I uh, last year read uh, Volume One of Invisibles. had not had not read uh, until now uh, his new X Men run, and so uh, I finally got to read about things I've heard about for years: the Genosian man- Massacre, Professor X's Womb Twin, and Zorn. So all those things were introduced in this first volume. 
uh, and this was a treat. Uh, I, I particularly like this. The X-Men were cool, kick-ass folks that dealt with weird Doom Patrol-like stuff. And uh, like I said, it was a lot of fun to read. And I have two more volumes to go. All right, next up is Animosity Volume 2, uh, issues 5 through 8, by uh, Rafael de la Torre, Marguerite Bennett, Rob Schwager, and Marshall Dillon. I read Volume 1 of this years ago, and um, I can't recall if I actually talked about it on the podcast or put it on the blog. Either way, I was impressed with the overall story and the world that they had created, but for some reason, I did not continue with it until now. Uh, while I was going through, and this is the reason, while I was going through my comics to see what I could remove from the collection, just things I no longer cared for, care about, didn't like, either way, I actually pulled a volume one of this and put it in the discard pile. But put it back in upon further thoughts. Like, well, I kept coming back to the idea of I really was impressed by what I read in volume one, and I was curious about what came next. So I put it back in. Um, and now many, 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 many months later, <laughs> I ordered this the second trade. And I have recently got in from another a more recent order, volume three. However, I now worry about the uh the rinse repeat nature of the story. Uh, that is, as they journey, uh, they will encounter obstacles along the way that are just variations on a theme. Will this be like The Walking Dead, which did get repetitive, or will it go in unexpected ways? So Volume 2 was kind of a letdown. We'll see how Volume 3 goes, uh, although I do kind of expect the former. So I need to decide if I want to invest more in this into this series or not. Like I said, I got Volume 3. Uh, I'm really curious if you read, you know, further along and enjoyed this and why. So please let me know what you thought about animosity as it went on. Um, I did quite enjoy the back matter of this trade, which gives us glimpse, glimpses into the world, into this world, including uh, brief descriptions of the affairs of each state in the United States and in countries around the world. Hmm, I wonder if they ever did any spinoffs to explore more of this world later on or... I, have to, I guess I have to look at that. All right, next up is uh, the Great British Bump Off Trade, issues one through four, by Max Saren, John Allison, Sammy Boris, and Jim Campbell. So, a new series by the same artist-writer team that gave me one of my favorite ser- comic book series of all time, Giant Days. Uh, yes, please. So I was very much looking forward to this to be uh, being collected so I could read it. Alas, the story, while entertaining for the most part, lacked the punch and clarity of Giant Days for me. Clarity of storytelling, um, not not in the sequentials, but just just the overall plot, I guess. Uh, so yeah, it's not not a knock on Saren's art because I love Max Saren's art. I think the I think the writer lost his way in the plot somewhat, basically. Uh, still very funny in parts. Uh, I would love it if this inhabited the same world as Giant Days, kind of like how uh, Terry Moore has all, basically all his books inhabit the same universe. Not necessarily that they cross over, although they have, but that, that would be kind of neat that uh, we would see the, the girls of Giant Days have an adventure with uh, the, uh, the detective uh, chef slash chef in this, in this book. So, uh, Okay, next up is, uh, I believe it's Triskel, Tris- Triskel? Uh, I, th- I pronounce it Triskel. <laughs> this is issue one uh, by uh, Mana Ramos and Felipe Pan. I saw this solicited, this uh, book solicited years ago. This is from Scout Comics, which at the time of this recording is having some issues uh, if you are uh, reading up on that. Anyway, I added it to my buy list, uh, my, my, well, my buy when the trade is released list because it had to do with Irish folklore and I love the cover. Uh, that's like it's like a crow skeleton slash main character mashup cover thing. It was it's really cool. Uh, only the, tri- the, at the at the time, only the trade has hadn't been released for nearly two years, and I decided to. It was a, that issue was still available. I could get it from DCBS, which I did. And also, I was thinking um, that I could. Uh, you know, just try it out and, and see if I wanted to buy the trade or buy the rest because the trade, as I said, has never been solicited. And given the issues with Scout, now I'm 
I'm thinking it won't. It won't be. And now watch. It'll be <laughs> it'll be solicited next month. But um, anyway, I, I was figuring that uh, no trade solicitation meant there was some issue with the quality of the book. Uh, but either way, I, I, I got the first issue, and uh, I found the mystical quality of the story interesting, uh, which was heightened by the expressive art. But the younger characters who were the main focus of the story didn't really capture my interest. I don't know. Um, and, and the way they spoke sometimes was anachronistic to me. They spoke like kids do today, not in the time setting. I don't know. I realize that this is a fantasy setting, but it seems like it's set in our past only with magical elements to it. Anyway, I didn't, I didn't really care for it. Um, if you're curious, as I was, a Triskel or Triple Spiral is, according to IrelandTravelGuides.com, this is just one of the sources I found, uh, is said to be the oldest symbol of spiro- spirituality. Its name comes uh, from the Greek words tri and skelos, which means three legs. It is an ancient symbol that has been associated with Celtic and pre-Celtic cultures, particularly those from the British Isles and parts of Western Europe. Uh, it's made up of three joining spirals, and I'm sure you've seen this all over the place. The three joining spirals, the ancient Irish believe that everything happens in batches of three or the th- or the third times the charm, a belief that still exists today. The spirals are also said to symbolize the inner and outer worlds and the theme of birth, death, and rebirth, as well as the unity of mental, physical, and spiritual self. So I thought that was, that's pretty cool. I like that concept. Given that, I wonder how much of this, of the symbolism of this played into this story. Um, I did see a little bit of it in, in this first issue, so maybe that's explored more in the other issues that were released. We'll see if I continue with this. I do remember that I could get all but one of the issues from either DCBS or uh, another source, uh, mycomicshop.com. So maybe if I expand my search a little bit, maybe I can find all of them. I just don't know if I want to do that because <laughs> I'm trying to cut down on, on books. <laughs> even though I read so many things. Next is Where the Body Was by Sean Phillips, Ed Brubaker, and Jacob Phillips, Um, which, you know, if you've you've listened to my podcast uh, for any length of time, whenever I talk about the uh, Phillips-Brubaker collaborations, you know they put out stellar work, and this is no exception. It's a very intimate, small-town murder mystery with a lot of interesting, messy, lovely human beings all caught up in each other's stories and not realizing it. Which is one of the one of the things I love about how comic books can tell that kind of a story. Uh, there are twists and turns, love and betrayal, and even a superhero of sorts in the story. Um, I think this is their best book since the Reckless series, which I think is probably their best uh, of all. Um, I, maybe I should do like a ranking episode sometime and go over these, but uh, highly recommended. Um, just like any other uh, Phillips Brubaker work. Uh, once in future volume five, the fi- final volume of that series, this is issues 25 through 30 by Dan Mora, Kieran Gillen, Tamara Bonvillain, and Ed Dukeshire or Dukeshire, Dukeshire. I don't know. Um, so this is the end of the literary saga of the series. Uh, and it, it started so well. I, I like the characters and the premise, uh, which was, is basically the old stories of Great Britain have come to life. Uh, with Merlin and a version of King Arthur, then Beowulf shows up, Robin Hood eventually, uh, more versions of King Arthur. Uh, so it's just, it's playing with story and myth and um, storytelling. And I just, I love that kind of stuff. Uh, uh, and But that's kind of where, by the by this fifth volume, I was, I was starting to lose my interest a little bit. I wanted more of the grandma character, Duncan, and especially Rose, who I became quite fond of in the first volume and you know she's in it she's all through this but i wanted more of her and her background her story and and whatnot but that that wasn't the point of the book um she does get a a bit of a spotlight in this this final volume which was nice but the latter stories overall seem to focus more on the fables which you know that's like i said that's one of the aspects aspects i liked but i just wanted more of of those other characters instead of them always reacting to the fables, to the stories. So yeah, it was a bit of a rinse-repeat plot-wise otherwise, but no, not to the extent of some other things I've read. So 
Uh, maybe they should have limited this to three volumes instead of five. But uh, either way, I quite enjoy this. You know, this was, I believe this is my first introduction to Dan Moore's art. And then, you know, he just blew up and is doing all sorts of really cool stuff at DC Comics. So that was nice. What wasn't so nice was the item next on my list, The Futurians by Dave Cockrum, Patty, and Jim Novak. So I've been wanting to read this graphic novel for years because it's by Cockrum. Um, and I finally pulled the trigger in the last few months uh, to get an old copy. And then I was disappointed in what I read. Uh, this is a, I think this is an example of an artist who lacks certain skills in trying to tell a story or just, or maybe it was, he was trying to do so much, but only had so many pages to do it. And it's just, it was just crammed full of things that were sort of half-baked and not quite developed and so many characters. So, you know, maybe uh, his reach, um, how's that, how's that go out, out? I don't know. He, he, it was too much. He, he was trying to do too much. Anyway, uh, the plot was overly complicated, but also at the same time familiar. It was just, it was like repeating familiar tropes. The characters were mostly one dimensional. The dialogue and captions, and there was a lot of those, uh, read very much like a, like a, mm, a bad Bronze Age Marvel superhero comic. And uh, one of the characters, Avatar, his constant uh, misogyny was so grating. You know, he was he was talking down to women. He was dismissing them. I, you know, that's part of his character, I guess. Fine, but it's just like, oh man, this is. I don't know. I probably when I was younger, I would have just glossed right over that. But the, now it's just like, oh, I do not like this guy. I don't like reading him talk like this. Um, I, I think if the if the characters he was talking to would have put him in his place, that'd be one thing. But it's just it's just ignored, and I that's maybe that's what I found so grating. I think if <laughs> I know I might be uh, pushing some buttons here, but if Cockrum had developed this comic with um, a talented writer, uh, this could have been something special, uh, perhaps. Um, otherwise, you know, I, the art is 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 nice for the most part. Um, I, I did like many of the character designs. Uh, there's some interesting ideas in it. It's just, like I said, it's kind of half-baked. Uh, next up, I read Black Panther. This is from the fir his first volume. Issue number 15 by Jerry Bingham, Ed Hannigan, Gene Day, George Russos, uh, Jasper Saladino, and Clem Robbins. Uh, this, is, this is a bit of an interesting book. I had been searching for years for a Daredevil issue where he fights Claw which is something that I remember reading from my childhood. I have a very specific memory of reading Daredevil fighting Claw. Uh, it was a comic book that I read at my cousin's house, along with an old Ghost Rider issue that I don't remember anything about other than I read it. So yeah, flash forward four decades, and I'm searching for Claw in the Marvel Unlimited app, and I'm scanning the covers to see if I, you know, it spurs some memory or something. And I see this Black Panther issue with Claw on the cover, and and I take a look. You know, I open up the book, and Eureka! This is the Daredevil issue I had been searching for. <laughs> Apparently, I, in my foggy memory, confused Daredevil with Black Panther somehow. And so I was reading through it, and I did recognize scenes from that one time I read it so long ago. So this is the issue I've been searching for. <laughs> so anyway, yeah. It was enjoyable to read, uh, you know, a nice little romp uh, through my comic book history. Yeah, so it was it was a delight in that way. Uh, like I said, this is from the first volume. It also happens to be the last issue of that volume. And then the story continued, I think, in Marvel premiere or Mar one of the Marvel anthology books or, or rotating anthology series. I don't know what it is, but I did read that. Did I read? No, I didn't read that next issue. I think I just kind of scanned it. One book I didn't scan, but I did read, is uh, Nightwing number 109 by Stephen Byrne, Tom Taylor, a Adriano, Lucas, and Wes Abbott. Uh, the, uh, I have not been the biggest fan of the Nightwing as pirate storyline that we've been getting, um, but this is not a bad issue. I do appreciate that they wrap up a loose end with the Rick Grayson fiasco uh, from a few years back, and I do really like the character of Beatrice Blood, or B, as as Dick calls her. 
I think I missed something introduced in this arc, um, or maybe it was from last arc. I don't, I, I have a vague memory of something being mentioned about this, but it's not, it's not, it was, it didn't loom large, uh, in my mind until this pirate storyline, which is namely Dick's anxiety about heights and him leaping. He has, he, he's going through something and, um, uh, but he he's able to overcome it, so it's not debilitating, and it's and it's barely addressed in it. So I'm not sure what this is all about. It seems like a distracting detail about uh, what's going on with Dick, but I don't know. I don't know how it's gonna wrap up or or be addressed. But anyway, I'm, I'm glad we're moving on after this issue's finale to uh, this arc. Batman Superman World's Finest number 22 by Dan Mora, Mark Wade, Tamara Bond Villain, and Steve Wands is the next one. It's the Return to Kingdom Come Part 3 story. Only, this isn't really a return to Kingdom, the Kingdom Come universe, if you will, so much as it's, uh, I, I, I believe that they're presenting this as it's earlier in the timeline than the Kingdom Come series, and so... Uh, there was a, a crossover with uh, our universe and their universe. Uh, and so that's what they're dealing with. A, pre- a prequel, if you will, to Kingdom Come. Uh, at this time, uh, Gog rules all, and he has plans for taking on Darkseid, the first step of which is turning Superman's former sidekick Thunderboy, now called Thunderman, uh, into the more familiar Magog character from the original series, which that adds a lot of depth to those two characters that was never there and never hinted at in the original Kingdom Come series. So I like that. Uh, Along the way, we get to see slightly different versions of our our familiar characters, which is something I always enjoy. Uh, Although it's, it's odd to see Wonder Woman, that universe's Wonder Woman, not somehow interact with our Batman and Superman. It's just, it's just that really the, the only crossover is the conflict between Batman and our Batman and Superman and the rest of that those characters and their interaction specifically with the Batman and Superman of the Kingdom Come or, or, or Earth 22 universe. So it was just, it seemed like an odd, I mean, I, I get why you would want to limit it to just the Batman and Superman of both universes, but it just seems odd that given how much Wonder Woman plays a role in Kingdom Come that that um you know she doesn't have a she didn't have a larger role but at the same time flip side wonder woman hasn't really been or has it all i don't remember now in 22 issues have we seen wonder woman interact with superman and batman in in the series i don't think so so maybe they're waiting on that uh, introduction of wonder woman i don't know I, i could be totally wrong about that but however not everyone is familiar at least to our Batman. One of them reminded me. So there's a there's a one page or a splash page showing three different characters that I did not recognize. Well, sort of recognize. Uh, one of them reminded me of the character Sideways from uh, the post New Fifty Two or shortly after New Fifty Two. Anyway, but with she, but he was wearing a jacket. Another looked like a looked like Tigress from the Young Justice animated series. Uh, although slightly different. And the third one is a werewolf that's on fire with chains wrapped around his arms and torso. And uh, this one, I had to do a little bit of research because I was really curious, like, oh, that that's a cool looking design. Who is that? And it turned out to be El Cadejo, a character inspired by Costa Rican folklore, according to an Instagram post by Dan Mora. And I want to see more of that one. Uh, World's Finest Teen Titans. Number six, the end of that series by Emanuela Lupacino, Mike Norton, Mark, uh, Mark Wade, Jordi Belair, and Steve Wands. I don't know if I've talked about this before. I know I've put it out on social media, but I wasn't going to buy these issues originally. I was just going to read it on the app. Um, I, it wasn't, uh, you know, it's just, I figured this was kind of like retelling the Teen Titans origin uh, in a slightly different fashion uh, in the world's finest, if you will corner of the DC universe history. But then I saw the Doc Shaner variant covers that featured one Titan per issue, and I had to get them. And so, of course, because I'm buying them, because originally for the covers, I had to read them. And boy, what a great series. I'm so glad that I ended up getting these. Uh, I, I feel like it modernizes the Bronze Age era Titans and redefines the characters and their relationships. Uh, for example, Wonder Girl and Aqualad have a brief relationship together that 
that goes through some tumultuous things. Uh, there's some friction between uh, Speedy and Robin, which that's not really a redefinition, but uh, Speedy is a lot more pointed about it, if you will. Uh, Fla- Kid Flash is a lot more kind of uh, not hero worshipy of Robin, but he definitely wants he wants to be Robin's friend, I guess. And I, I think that's kind of reverse playing around with the idea that. Uh, Dick Grayson and Wally West are best friends, which I don't think they ever really were shown that, even through the New Teen Titans era. Uh, that, I think that's something that came later and was kind of retconned into existence. But that's okay. I, I, I was fine with that. And then they also introduced Bumblebee as a, if not a founding member, an early member of the Teen Titans, which, you know, she didn't come around until that second volume of when they brought back Teen Titans in the 70s. So that was nice to see. Oh, and, and then, of course, Mal Duncan is is part of it as well. So we get a little bit of diversity and, you know, less white male characters involved. So I, I appreciated that. Anyway, it was a, brush, a breath of fresh air when it comes to Titans comics. So once that trade is solicited, you know, if you haven't read this or, you know, you don't have the, the app, you know, check it out if you're a Titans fan, because I, I think you'll be pleasantly surprised at this. Uh, another uh, book I would have been well, not not surprised, I would, but <laughs> has been pleasant to read uh, is Wonder Woman number four by Daniel Samper, Tom King, Tomeo More, and Clayton Coles. Much like Dan Mora on Batman, Superman, or Greg Smallwood on Human Target, Samper has been an utter surprise. Well, I guess there is a surprise here <laughs> uh, at how well he is at his craft. Um, I didn't really read, uh, I don't remember reading much of Sam Pear's work before this. I think he was on Dark Crisis, maybe? Uh, anyway, this is such a beautiful book. As for the overall story, I'm liking the political nature of it and how Diana is responding to this. There's this character called the King of America. He's an interesting villain, but given how entrenched the character is apparently in the DCU, as shown here in this these Wonder Woman issues... Uh, even though he's a new one, I'm wondering, I'm hoping if someone else will play with this. Probably not. But it's just, it's it's an odd kind of thing because it, it recolors everything you thought you knew about DC, the DC universe, politics of the DC universe, that kind of thing. So it's like, hmm, this is, you know, Tom King is is always throwing out these interesting, fresh, not not necessarily everything works, but I appreciate the attempt for sure. Uh, anyway, uh, this particular issue, number four, Diana fulfills a dying boy's wish despite the challenges that go along with it. Th- this was very emotional, very poignant. There's a, this wonderful scene where the two of them talk, and um, I just it was just it was just lovely. Um, so I'm really looking forward to what comes next with this. I I am reading this on the DCU app. I decided to not get the single issues, but I will definitely be getting the trade collections as they come out, as long as King and Sam Perry are are on it for sure. Alan Scott, Green Lantern, The Green Lantern, number three by Kean Tormey, Tim Sheridan, Matt Herms, Chris uh, Sotomayor, and Lucas uh, Gattoni. Uh, This is uh, a miniseries featuring my favorite and, uh, if I may, the best Green Lantern, Alan Scott. Uh, Of course, I had to get it uh, because of that. Instead of waiting, (laughs) I wanted to show my love for Alan Scott. Uh, I love the retcon that that Alan is a a gay man and was a closeted gay man for much of his life. Uh, And dealing with that, uh, well, in this series, he's dealing with that in the early days of his superheroing. Uh, A little bit of blackmail there from the FBI director in an earlier issue. Uh, He's uncomfortable uh, being around a group of other superheroes, the JSAers, although I don't know that they're the Justice Society just yet. Uh, Maybe they're the all-star squadron. I don't remember now, but anyway, just seeing Alan deal with that, uh, do it being, you know, the green lantern and all that kind of stuff. And then there's also the the introduction of this red lantern character, you know, being retconned into, into existence, but uh, that's interesting. And there's a direct tie there with Alan's past and his, one of his uh, former lovers who died, you know, I, I won't spoil it, but uh, that's been really interesting to read as well. In this particular issue, number three, um, uh, Alan teams up with the Spectre to track down the killer that Alan's been chasing the, in the first two issues. 
Uh, there's a wonderful scene between the two hero heroes where Specter tells Ellen, if God himself didn't want you to love, then how could you? Amen. All right, back to Titans, number six by Travis Moore, Tom Taylor, Tamara Bond villain, and Steve Wands. Um, remember what I said about the world's finest Teen Titans book? Well, this series, despite the fact that it's written by the same guy whom I love on Nightwing and uh, other things I've read of his, um, I felt was pretty much not up to par for a couple different reasons. I did not care for how Nicholas Scott draws the Titans um, in the earlier issues, because I think she tends to draw faces pretty much the same, no matter who it is, uh, which is weird because her work on Wonder Woman Historia was so good. I So I don't know. I do So in other words, I do prefer Travis Moore's work in this issue for the Titans. Um, and despite how the Titans was supposed to be the new Justice League in the DC Universe, it was kind of too bogged down in the Brother Eternity story. I did like how the, the Titans dipped their toes in environmentalism, but, you know, through, through Beast Boy, but the rest has been really just kind of uninspired hero- super heroics. This issue, however, focused on Starfire, uh, which was appropriate for the big reveal at the end. Uh, although that was another thing I did not care for. <laughs> just another weird retcon of Starfire's past. And I don't know. As you'll see next time I do a Polis review, the, there's a change in, in the, the Titan series that I'll talk about later. All right. Next up is Radiant Black Volume 4. This, uh, this features issues 19 through 24 by uh, Marcelo Costa. Kyle Higgins, Eduardo uh, Ferragato, uh, Zay Carlos, Carlos Eduardo, Raul Angulo, Igor Monte, Rod Fernandez, and Becca Carey. So this collection features Nathan and Marshall sharing the radiant powers, each one showing certain strengths as compared to the other with the powers. Uh, but the radiant powers start glitching and they find out about a coming threat much worse than they've dealt with before in the previous three volumes. So they return to what's called existence there, where they communicate with the Radiant or some aspect of it or something. I'm not quite sure. Some truths are revealed in this uh, encounter, and they are given an ultimatum by the end of, of this volume. Only one of them can possess the Radiant, and they must choose which of them will take it. And so I have to read volume five for that next thing. I really like how unconventional this series is at times. Uh, You know, at first the lead, the lead character, uh, and then, but then his friend takes on the, uh, well, is, is the radiant, but then his friend takes on the role that was unexpected. The, uh, the, the continued sharing of powers uh, that's, that's a little different than, than usual, the usual superhero type thing. And there's a lot more stuff to it too, but uh, I, Kyle Higgins can, can write a, a pretty interesting uh, world. And I like that. And now, you know, like I said, they're, they're sharing the role and now that one of them has to give it up. What is that going to be like? So yeah, I just like how they're playing with the, the usual superhero tropes in this. Here's that final book where I, I'm like, uh, I'm not going to talk about it because it's Legion of Superheroes number 45, which is part of, a uh, the Legion project podcast in the feed so uh at the time of this recording that's not in the feed but i'm sure it will be before this episode comes out for sure so yeah you'll have to tune in uh for that to see what peter and i thought of that issue and and other things related to uh legion of superhero comics at that time at the same time that 45 came out all right detective comics 38 by so many people i'm not even gonna list them uh this is a facsimile (laughs) <laughs> a comic that I bought uh, recently, uh, you know, because it came out a while ago, but I thought, you know what? I kind of want that because it features, you know, it, it, the, the lead story is the debut of Robin. And uh, I, while I've read that story and other things like a, an old um, digest by DC Comics, I wanted to have that facsimile. Plus, I wanted to read all the other things. Uh, but I will say just to start off with, my God, the comic strips back then were wordy. Were so many words, so many words. But besides the the debut of Robin, I I, I kind of like the Steve Malone District Attorney story by Don Lynch and uh, the Slam Bradley strip by Jerry Siegel and Dennis Neville. So there's a bunch of other things in there too, but those are the two that really grab me. 
All right, we're coming up to the end of this. Couple more comics. Uh, all new collector's edition C58 by Rich Buckler, Jerry Conway, Dick Giordano, Adrian Roy, and Jasper Saladino. This is the Superman versus Shazam story put out uh, as a treasury. I read it, however, uh, in the Superman versus Shazam uh, trade collection. And uh, I've, I've actually been looking for that that treasury for a while now because I just really love Rick, uh, Rich Buckler's art and uh, coupled with uh, Giordano. But boy, this was this was a disappointment, kind of like the Futurians too. It's uh, it's kind of like uh, someone in DC at that time said, you know what the kids will love? Superman and Captain Marvel beating on each other. Yeah. Uh, except for the, peer, the appearance of Mary Marvel and Supergirl, who are the only rational superpowered beings in the story. Oh, wait, no, really. Uh, they were until the end when out of the blue, Mary comes on to Superman and then Supergirl comes on to Captain Marvel just to show Mary how ridiculous she's being. And then they all laugh about it in the end. Yeah. Uh, boy, let me know if you like this story for for whatever your reasoning is, because I it was just to me, it was a waste of the Buckler Giordano art. So, oh, well, uh, speaking of Rich Buckler, the final book I have to talk about that I read in January of 2024, DC Comics presents number 49 by Rich Buckler, Roy Thomas, Paul Kupperberg, John Kalman, Jean D'Angelo and John Costanza. Uh, this was also in that Superman versus Shazam trade. I believe it's an issue of the comic that I have in my collection. I just hadn't read it yet, so I just went ahead and read it. Uh, this was a cute show us the Earth One equivalent of another multiverse Earth character, namely the Earth One Billy Batson. And I, you know, they did this a few times back in the Bronze Age era, um, and uh, th- it was always interesting to see this. Superman encounters this Billy when Black Adam makes his way to Earth One. And Earth One Billy tries to help out, but then gets grabbed by uh, uh, Black Adam, and Superman has to go get Captain Marvel to help out. Uh, and they, you know, they save the day, of course. But it is Earth One, the Earth One Billy, who engineers Black Adam's defeat by the tried and true method of mispronouncing the wizard Shazam's name. And those are just. <laughs> Uh, that doing that. And then also, I mean, I've seen that so many times with Superman and Mitch's Pitalik, where it's like, how stupid is the, are these characters? If they feel compelled to say the name correctly to show, you know, lord it over the person. Uh, but then, you know, they're, they're dumb enough to fall for it. I, I just, <laughs> I got to that point of the story. I'm like, oh my God, really? Otherwise it was a, I, I felt a pretty good issue of DC Comics Presents. So anyway, there you go. Those are some of the 55 comics that I read in January, uh, 2024. Uh, let me know if you have any, uh, thoughts about these comics, disagree with me, agree with me. Anyway, uh, I'd love to hear from you. Please send me email at longboxreview at gmail.com, or you can leave uh, comments at the website as well. Uh, and with that, uh, thanks for listening and I will talk to you later. Bye-bye.